the early bird gets the revelation. <laughs> I'm sure that's scripture somewhere. We could find that somewhere. I got about nine messages rolling through me right now, so this is supposed to be a one-hour service. We'll, we'll, we'll see now, won't we? <laughs> uh, it surprises me uh, in some measure the sequence, uh, how the Lord puts these messages together. Uh, last Sunday morning and Sunday night, uh, to me, I see Sunday morning we talk about how God looks at the place called done. Sunday night, I believe, was uh, how God reveals his bare arm. How many of you would like for God? If you have a problem, that's a major mountain. And it's, you know, it's a big one. But if God comes and you see him coming, and as he's coming, he starts rolling up his sleeve. <laughs> he's going to reveal his, the power of his bare arm against your mountain. Who do you think is going to win that battle? There is no mountain. Now, there is a way for you every time to get that kind of power, the bare arm of the Lord revealed. So that was Sunday night. And then Wednesday night was really how do you negate that power? We called it the only obstacle to revival. Hint, it's us. <laughs> God's not going to change. His word is not going to change. The devil is not going to change. The good news about that is we can change. Okay? And we can become those people who learn how to get the strength, the power of the bare arm of the Lord manifested in the earth, not only on your mountain, but eventually the idea is revival. Will you get his bare arm reve uh, revealed against their mountain? You know, no matter what it might be. Uh, go ahead and open up to Luke chapter 1. A friend of mine who's been listening to these messages named Jeff lives in Arizona. Uh, he sent me an email based on these teachings. And Jeff, if you're listening to this, I'm, I'm doing my best to remember to give you credit for it this one time and this one time only. <laughs> After today, it's bone of my bone. It's, it's like that steak I ate the other day. Now, that steak belonged to Longhorn before I ate it. But that steak now is bone of my bone. <laughs> it's part of me. Well, that's the way this revelation is. But he was, yes, sir. Okay, now for those of you that were not here Sunday night and did not hear or have not listened to it on the internet, let me give you a quick synopsis. Go back to, keep your place in Luke, go back to Isaiah chapter 52. Let's look at the bare arm of the Lord. And Isaiah, the prince of prophets, God really showed him the. Uh, Hundreds of years ahead of time, the burial and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. He saw it. He saw it vividly. He saw it like he was there. <laughs> it's amazing. And uh, he's prophesying about that in all through many of these chapters. But we're just going to pick it up here in chapter 52, starting in verse 9. It says, Break forth into joy, sing together, you waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord hath comforted his people... He hath redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations. God did something, and really Isaiah is seeing it ahead of time, but he's saying it as though it's past time. We don't have time to teach the place called done right again now, but anyway. <laughs> the Lord hath bared his holy arm. In the eyes of all the nations, God has shown forth his strength, the strength of his bare arm. And all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Depart ye, depart ye, go ye out from thence, touch no unclean thing. Go you out of the midst of her, be you clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. For you shall not go out with haste, nor go by flight, for the Lord will go before you, and the God of Israel will be your rear now this one is different will be your rear ward I think it says re-reward okay 
straighten it. Anyway, now they keep, they keep, you know, I had to, I told you I had to buy a new Bible, remember? I opened my Bible one day, the one I had before this, and I'd lost all of creation. <laughs> Genesis chapters one and two had just fallen out somewhere, so I opened it up, and it began with chapter three. I don't want a Bible that begins with the curse. <laughs> So I had to go buy a new Bible, and they've, this one is apparently is another, uh, it says King James on it, but they've, that's different. Anyway, verse 13, behold, my servant, now he's talking about Jesus here, he's prophesying, my servant shall deal prudently, he shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. And here's that, so you can't miss who he's talking about. As many were astonished, or you could say astonished at thee. His visage, you could say his countenance, you could say what he looked like, was so marred more than any man. His form more than the sons of men. And what that means is, what really happened to Jesus on the cross in his spirit as well as in his body? I know, I know uh, they tried to do a good job in that movie, the the passion of the Christ and they did a fair job of showing what the lashings and all did to his body but see he didn't just take the lashings he became sin and he bore our sicknesses and carried our pains everything that could happen to a human being in the fall happened to him I my opinion is that's I think that may be partly why God it says the sky was darkened during that period of time to kind of hide what was happening to him. But Isaiah saw it. He said he was, his form, it didn't, it was marred more than the sons of men. In plain English, he says, what I saw hanging there, I wasn't sure if it was a man or a deer. What is that? We really have not yet comprehended what Jesus truly suffered for us. But it's part of how the Lord bared his arm. The strength of his bare arm is involved right here on moving every mountain you'll ever face. Verse 15, so shall he sprinkle many nations. The kings shall shut their mouths at him. For that which had not been told them shall they see. And that which they had not heard shall they consider. Now verse 53, who hath believed our report. What report? The one he's talking about right there. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. When you hear the gospel and what God did through his son to reveal his bare arm in the earth, those who believe that report, look at the next sentence. He says, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? It's those who believe God's report. How do you know you're saved? God's report tells you, he who knew no sin, he was made to be sin, that we could be made the righteousness of God in Christ, justified by faith in him. You have to believe that report. How do I know I'm healed? Himself bore your sicknesses and carried his pains and with, carried your pains and with his stripes you were healed. Glory to God. Yeah, but, but I'm, but I'm, but how do I know he'll help me financially? For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that you, through his poverty, not your giving, through his poverty, might be rich. You have to believe his report. You've got to believe what God's word says if you want the bare arm, that strength, that power of God. Well, there's all kinds of reports that come in life. I've had reports. You've had reports. It's not good sometimes when you get the medical report. I had a report. Gave me six months to live. Had melanoma cancer. That was the report. Said, young man, we're going to do our best for you, but you have melanoma cancer, the fastest, most fastest spreading, most deadly kind. We're going to send you to MD Anderson Hospital in Houston. And they're going to do their best for you, but my counsel to you, by the way, I was only 40, I think, 40-something. I hadn't started here yet, so we started here in 40, when I was 45, so I was probably 42. We give you six months, you know, get your affairs in order. Well, now there's a report for you. <laughs> That's a fair mountain, you know. How do you get the bare arm of the Lord revealed? 
you got to you got to believe his report you got to go to God's word find out what he said put your faith in what he said and I don't care if you got to walk what does it matter if you got to walk the floor 10 hours a day for a while till you till you move your heart not your mind your heart in agreement with what God said to where you believe his report over any other report when you do that now you have the bare arm of the Lord revealed and if you don't do that then you're likely to fall victim to the earthly report to whom is the arm of the, to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed those who believe his report glory to God that's the word of God and God says I will not alter the thing that has gone out of my mouth I will not break my covenant with you that covenant he made with Jesus I did a series two or three years ago called the unbreakable covenant even though God made all those promises to Abraham he was really promising them through Abraham to his seed 88 88 Abraham was the mediator you mix those two together together you have abriator or something <laughs> Abraham was the mediator of that covenant between God the Father and God the Son and you can't break it you can run from it. You can exclude yourself out of it, but you can't break it because it's between God the Father and God the Son. Glory to God. I want to go back and preach that one right now, but I can't. <laughs> well, who is it then where the, that they see the end result of God bearing his arm? Those who believe his report. Now, Jeff sent me an example I hadn't really connected up yet. And again, Jeff, this is your one time and one time only where I give you credit for it. Go to Luke 1 now. Boy, this is so clear. We'll pick it up here with, in Mary's account, and then we're going to maybe back up a little bit. You know, uh, Gabriel came to two people in Luke chapter 1, and he brought the word of the Lord. He literally brought the word, a report, you could say. Brought one to Zacharias. And he brought one to Mary. Now we're going to look at Mary's first. So let me see here. Hmm. Okay. Verse 26, I suppose. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God into a city of Galilee named Nazareth. To a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among, among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary. For thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Now then said Mary unto, this, unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord. Now get this. Be it unto me according to thy word. She believed the report. The angel brought the report. You could sum it up in verse 31 where he said, Behold, thou shalt conceive. There is the report. The word of the Lord has come to her. Thou shalt conceive. Verse 38, 
She asked a question first, but she said, Be it unto me according to thy word. All right. Now later when she, she starts a, what we call the song of Mary, I want you to come down to verse 51 of that same chapter. <laughs> let's, just, let's just pick it up here. And, well, okay, I got it. I can't, let's read it first. Because she did that, look what Mary says about this. Verse 51, he hath shown strength with his arm. <laughs> Glory to God. <laughs> he has shown strength with his arm. She believed the report of the Lord. He, his power came upon her body. If you believe his report, his power will come upon your body. If you believe his report, his power will come upon your finances. If you believe his report, his power will come upon your wayward children. You got to believe his report if you want his power of his bare arm revealed in your life. Say, say it with me. Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Now let me show you what keeps this from working. And we've got it in the same chapter. Now back up, back up here. Let's look at Zacharias. Notice, as soon as Mary said that, verse 38, be it unto me according to thy word, the angel left. Mission accomplished. Mary was on track. This is going to happen. All right, we're, we done good. Something different happened with Zacharias. And there's a reason. So let's pick it up here in verse 5 of chapter 1. It said, There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias, of the course of Abia, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. Now, when it says that, we know nobody perfectly kept the law. What that means is whenever they would make a mistake, let's say it worse, whenever they sinned, they would offer the appropriate sacrifice. And when you did that, according to the law, you're blameless. So they were doing, that's why it says that, says it that way. It didn't say they walked without sin. It says they walked in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord. Blameless. They had no child because that Elizabeth was barren and they were both now well stricken in years. And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. Now here we go. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. Now this is John the Baptist, of course. Thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth, for he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. Is this a good report or what? What would you think? That's a good report, isn't it? And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias, but it's Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Is that a good word? <laughs> Same angel. And Zechariah said unto the angel, now his question sounds a lot like Mary's, but it's not. Mary's was just wanting to know how. He is wanting to know, is this going to happen? He says, whereby shall I know this? How do I know you're telling me the truth, in other words? Whereby shall I know this? <laughs> you can tell the spirit that he says is in from Gabriel's response. <laughs> he says, and then Zechariah said unto the angel, whereby shall I know? Here comes an angel. He gives you the word of the Lord, and you go, how do I know this is true? Okay. It, For I am an old man, and my wife is well spricken. Spricken. Here we go again. I'm sp not spricken. Stricken. For I am an old man, my wife well stricken in years. <laughs> and notice how the angel, he's going, how do, I know, how do I know this? And the angel, he goes, I am Gabriel. <laughs> 
I stand in the presence of God? He sent me here to speak this to you and to show you these glad tidings. And you're wanting to know how you can know this is true. I'm Gabriel. I'm standing here in front of you, giving you the word of the Lord. Can you tell his attitude is completely different? And behold, now notice the angel didn't just leave him. Now notice what happens. And behold, thou shalt be dumb. Well, he was already dumb. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I don't mean any disrespect. I thank God for Zacharias. Don't write me no letters, please. <laughs> no, what he means is you're going to be silent. You're not going to be able to speak. Until the day that these things shall be performed. And why? Because you don't believe. Remember Wednesday night? What is the only obstacle to revival? It's our unbelief. Gabriel's looking right at this guy. Let me ask you. Is it important to the plan of God that John the Baptist be born? Who was it baptized Jesus in the River Jordan? It is important to the plan of God that this man be born. And this guy, Zacharias, is not believing. So what does the angel do to keep Zacharias from wrecking the plan of God? He shut his mouth. A friend of mine has a series called, You Need to Learn the Art of Shut Up. <laughs> Sometimes the best thing you can do, if you can't say what God said, shut up. Those fiery darts are aimed at your mouth because that's where the release of authority comes from. Why else would, I mean, Gabriel can't change the man's heart. He can't change the man's mind, can he? But one thing he can do, he can change the man's mouth. Are you going to have to have Gabriel come and change your mouth? Oh, God, send an angel to shut my mouth. No, your wife will do it. She can do it for you, huh? <laughs> or vice versa. <laughs> no, it doesn't work the other way. Anyway. <laughs> Whoops, I didn't say that out loud. Kyle, help me. <laughs> no, leave it on. <laughs> I want you to see the importance of this. How, how important are the words of your mouth? How important was the words of Zacharias' mouth? The angel knew he'd be going around saying... I don't know. I thought it was an angel. He said his name was Gabriel. He said the strangest thing to me. I mean, the report of God is that me and this old woman here, after all these years, we're going to have a baby. I don't know. It must have been the pizza I ate. No, the, uh, what did they eat? It wasn't pizza. <laughs> it must have been the unleavened bread I ate or something. It must, wasn't cooked long enough or something. He would have been bad-mouthing the whole thing, and it... Now, get this. Get this. This is important. Gabriel wasn't doing that just to be mean. Gabriel did that so that the Word of God would be accomplished in Zechariah's life. What you say. We have preached it and preached it and preached it about the power of confession. Now, I've got to tell you, there is two levels of that. At first... You are confessing unto. You are, you are changing your own heart. You could even be, say, changing your own mind. But it's more than changing the mind. I'm telling you, I have won faith victories where my mind was a mess. My doubts were flying through my brain like machine gun bullets. I mean, but my heart would not leave what God had. I've told you before about that time that the, our ministry went into debt. And it went into debt quite pretty severe for several years. And I couldn't understand it. I mean, God, God had told me about all these things, but he'd never said one word about going into debt. <laughs> this was a total shock to me. I wasn't expecting it. And it looked like everything that we were doing was a lie. You know, everything I was preaching, God will provide, obey, obey God, and he will provide. And here we're going into debt. And my, you talk about doubts. 
But I, you ask my staff or anybody that was around me, you never heard me saying anything about it. Now, I may have had all kinds of, in my mind, all kinds of warfare going on. Now, me and God, every now and then, I have to admit, there was a time or two, and they, like Dave says, my lower lip was interfering with the gas pedal when I drove, you know. Whether I said it out loud or not, I don't remember. But I know I, on the inside, I was going, oh, God, oh, God. I used to have a sterling credit rating. I started obeying you. Look at me now. Used to be out of debt. Now we're in debt. If people knew what was going on, they wouldn't believe a word I said, God, you know. And, but, but, and see, my mind came up with a thousand ways to fix it. My mind did. It came up with a thousand ways. I mean, I would catch myself daydreaming about doing this and doing that. There's all kinds of... All Ishmael's you can create to help, help God get you out of this problem. Don't you do that. But I did guard my mouth. And see how I know I guarded my heart is because I did not deviate from what he told me to do. Bless God if I wound up bankrupt and in the poor house and living under a bridge in a gunny sack, me and Sue, I was, I was going to give everything away free till the last drop. <laughs> Because that's what, and I'm not going to send an appeal letter, and I'm not going to this. Whatever he said, that's what we were going to do. And that's how you know if you're still in faith. And I, plus, I did guard my mouth. You did, they didn't hear me going around, oh, God, oh, God, what are we going to do? I may be thinking that, but I wasn't saying that. <laughs> but see, Zacharias would have been saying it. And it's, when you say it, I'm telling you, those fiery darts, first they're aimed at your mouth, but then eventually they're aimed at your action. They're trying to get you off the plan of God, trying to get you to go fix something. And those of you that haven't heard the rest of the story, I don't recognize everybody here. We held to the course God gave us. We didn't change. We didn't do anything to get out of debt. He just began speaking to the hearts of different people all over the world, Australia and Germany and all over the world. And within a year, he got us out of that debt, never been back in it since. In fact, we've actually got a surplus. Everyone worship God with me just for a minute. <laughs> Hallelujah. There's a little, there's some surplus, God. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Faith is of the heart. But your mouth, this is in here for our learning, for our edification. I hope to God Gabriel never has to come shut my mouth. I hope he doesn't have to come and literally make me dumb. Let's finish the story just so you'll know now. It really did happen. Let me read that verse again, verse 20. Behold, thou shalt be dumb, not able to speak, and not able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed, because thou believest not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. The people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he tarried so long in the temple, and when he came out, he could not speak unto them. They perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple. For he beckoned unto them <laughs> and remained speechless. I think he was probably going, I don't know how big Gabriel was, you know. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know for those of you that can't see me, I'm like rocking a baby in my arms and pointing like something big was in there like an angel. And he was beckoning to them, you know. <laughs> And when he came out, he could not speak unto them. They perceived that he'd seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned unto them, but remained speechless. And it came to pass that as soon as the days of his ministration were accomplished, he departed to his own house. And after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself five months, saying, Thus hath the Lord dealt with me in the days wherein he looked on me to take away my reproach among men. And in the sixth month, oh, then we go into Mary's thing. So, okay, hang on here now. Where is it? Yes. Verse 57. Now Elizabeth's full time came that she should be delivered, that she should be delivered. She brought forth a son. Her neighbors and her cousins heard how the Lord had shown great mercy upon her, and they rejoiced with her. And it came to pass that on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child, and they called him Zacharias. After the name of his father. And his mother answered and said, Not so, but he shall be called John. And they said unto her, There is none of thy kindred that is called by this name. And they made signs to his father how he would have him called. And he asked for a writing table and wrote, saying, His name is John. And they marveled all. And his mouth was opened 
immediately his tongue loosed and he spake and he praised God. Hallelujah. You reckon he was a believer by then? <laughs> I think even he believed it. See, he's like a doubting Thomas. I'll believe it when I put my hands in the, in the scars, you know. Now, he believed it when he held the baby, basically, when he saw the baby born. But real faith is like Mary's faith. Be it unto me according to thy word. Yes, sir. My goodness. Okay. Okay. Um, well, I, I didn't expect this, really. He is going to talk about that. <laughs> Go to one of the Peters somewhere. First or second. I don't, I don't know. I'll tell you in a minute. I have them in me by image, not by chapter and verse. I think it's First Peter. Yes, chapter 5. Now, whose report are we going to believe? Now, right now, we're going to talk about in the natural things. Talking about you and your healing. We're going to talk about your bread. Remember the message about the two breads? Matthew 6 says, give us this day our daily bread. And then Jesus teaches all about why take you thought for what you're going to wear, what you're going to eat, consider the lily, consider the fowls of the air. That whole teaching there surrounding give us this day our daily bread has to do with you coming to the place where you know he is your source, he is your provider. You don't need to live a life of fear based on, on circumstances, all right? Then over in Luke 11, though, when he says the same prayer, and he says, give us day by day our daily bread. In that passage, he's not really talking so much about your bread. He's talking about revival. He's talking about your, you being able to serve bread to those that you come across from the Father's table. And there he talks about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We talked about that Wednesday night. It's amazing how all of these tie together, okay? But see, the enemy's job is to put... What is Mark 4? What did Jesus say? How does the enemy derail your life? How does, how does he keep us from revival? How does he keep from manifesting anything? Well, it's daily. It's the cares of this world. Afflictions, persecutions, the cares of this world. Let's just say daily. My 92-year-old my mother, while Sue and I were in Florida, we'd, at the end of the ministry, we preached in three different churches in about two weeks. And then we took two days for ourselves, you know, and we... We went down to Miami, and we drove up the East Coast. Of course, I talked to my 92-year-old mother two or three times a day. I said, I think we're about ready to head back. And she says, now here's 92-year-old wisdom. She says, don't rush it, son. Life sure gets daily really quick when you get back. <laughs> that is exactly what the devil knows, too. And how he intends to derail you is daily. Persecutions, afflictions, get you involved in the cares of this world. And if you can't really do that, then he'll get you running off after the deceitfulness of riches. And if that doesn't work, he'll eventually get you into the lust of other things. And that's the God complex, you know, where you start thinking more highly of yourself than you ought. But I can't, we can't teach on that. That's all foundational stuff that should already be in you. If it's not, Dave has all those tapes available at his website. Get them in you. Now, I was teaching on what? Oh, yeah, 1 Peter. Now, concerning <laughs> the cares of this world. See? I'm contending for revival. I'm going down to that church on Thursday. I'm telling you, I'm going to pray Thursday night and Friday and Friday night. I'm going to fast. I'm going to watch what I say. I'm going to confess the word. I'm going to do all that, and I'm going to do all this. And then the very next day, they give you a week's notice. And that's the end of your job. Ow! I was going to have revival. Oh, God, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Oh, God, oh, God, I got bills to pay. You know, and then you're going to start trying to fix it. Aren't you? Don't lie to me. <laughs> well, that's the normal. That's how he does it. Get you off into this and that. You don't have time to pray now. You don't have time to seek the Lord. You're too busy going from job to job, putting in applications and doing everything. And plus, or, or all of a sudden they'll change it. And now you've got to work overtime just to make what you used to make in a normal week. Now you got to work 80 hours to make what you used to make in 40 hours. I'm just saying that his options are endless if, you're suscept if you are susceptible is what I'm trying to say. If you are able to be seduced by worry. See? Now, Peter, here in chapter 5, 1 Peter chapter 5, 
starting, I know you've heard this so many times, but I'm going to give you a pretty good example here. Um, let's start in verse 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. For him to come and lift you higher, wouldn't that be kind of a picture of his bare arm coming to you? He's come to lift you up, exalt you, and that what exalt is. Where you are now, he's going to raise you higher. This is another example of his arm being manifested, the strength of his arm being manifested in your life. Well, I want to humble myself then. If the key is to humble myself under his hand, that's what I want to do, Brother Gary. How do I do that? Well, you do it by verse 7. How do you humble yourself under his hand? Casting all, turn to someone and say all. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, now notice, as a roaring lion. It doesn't say he is a roaring lion. He is as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, meaning he can't devour everybody. Can't devour everybody. He's seeking those that he can devour. Verse 9 says, Whom resist steadfast in the faith. And if you're going to leave it in the context, how do you resist him steadfast in the faith? By refusing to take the care. You refuse it. I don't care. If, and that can be real work. You may have to work at refusing it. You may have to cast your care on him 27 times an hour. <laughs> Do you find still something gets settled in your heart? I have a friend, business friend of mine who uh, he's been a partner with our ministry for at least 10 years, I think. And uh, we have a good relationship. I mean, I know him and been to, I've had bread in his house. He lives in another state. And uh, our ministry was even involved in, in uh, him getting married and the child that they have. And, it's been a very interesting, it's been a good relationship, you know. Now, he's not one of these ultra, ultra, ultra millionaires, but he's, he's, he's a businessman, got a nice business going. And uh, recently, we saw him in April again. And while we were there, I happened to have on my, you know, being the grandpa that I am, I have about a thousand videos of my grandchildren on my iPhone. And in the course of it, I don't know how this happened, I wound up showing him a few of those videos. <laughs> which happens everywhere I go. <laughs> well, one of them was a video that I call Red Shoe Dancing. And it's a video of Cole, who is nine. Cole will be 10 in July. And this was just a little short time ago, maybe a few months ago. And in this video, his mom and dad had bought him a brand new pair of Converse red tennis shoes. He loves those tennis shoes. He put those on at our house, and he says... These make me feel so good, I just got to dance in them. <laughs> Man, he's just getting it. And I can't do it at all like him. You know, he, like, how does Dave do that? Anyway, you know. <laughs> I mean, but Cole, now he's getting with it. He, he can really dance. And he's, you know, he's doing Gundam style. He's doing everything, you know. Oh, yeah, this. With these red know? shoes. Yep. Okay, do the Gundam style. <laughs> and, and I showed that to my business friend while I was up there. And of course, I showed him videos of Lily and other ones too, you know. Well, anyway, we're back and we're doing our, going about our daily work. And a few weeks ago, just a few, maybe two or three weeks ago, then I get a, I get a phone call from him. And he says, uh, the, uh, the business that he's in, he has basically 14, uh, not, not like residential clients, but business clients for his business. But his supplier had notified him that effective almost immediately, they were going to double the price of everything that he supplies, which means he has to go to his customers, basically. 
Now, they were tweaking it a little bit. In other words, there's going to be a slight benefit, a slight benefit. But the end result for, for this slight benefit, we're going to double. He has to double the price that they pay every month. How many of you think they're going to go for that? And it's a very competitive business. Well, his first thought is, I mean, he's got a wife, a child, and two twins on the way. Okay, young man. What kind of thoughts go through your mind? Gunny sack, bridge. <laughs> you know? <laughs> right? You know? So, now he's been a partner with us for years. He's listened to everything he knows all about praying and, you know, the praying in the Spirit. So he started seeking the Lord. Starts praying, seeking the Lord, trying to resist fear, you know, but seeking the Lord. What do I do? What do I do? And he fully expected to hear some kind of business answer, you know, like, okay, rebundle your product this way, uh, change your pricing schedule that way, uh, do this, do that, you know. And plus he come up with about 14 answers on his own how to do it, you know. <laughs> but, but he said he didn't really hear anything like that from God. So then he said, so I did what I've heard Gary say he does when he has a big problem. I took a nap. <laughs> And sometimes that's the best thing. You know, you get your mind quiet. He said, in that nap, he had a dream. And in the dream, I was showing him that video of my grandson doing that red shoe dancing. And he says, I, I looked on his face. That boy was not worried about nothing. He was full of joy and happiness and just dancing for joy because he had those red shoes. And he says, I knew what the wisdom was. The wisdom was God wanted me on the inside, no matter what it was like on the outside. The wisdom was, son, be red shoe dancing. <laughs> Cast all of the care of this over on me. He said, that's the wisdom that I got. It wasn't any business wisdom. He says, now, do you think that was easy to do? He says, every time my brain would start getting into that worry, worry, man, here I... Now, he says, I, I didn't always actually start dancing, <laughs> but... In his spirit, he'd go, nope, I refuse this. I'm going to be just like Cole. I am red shoe dancing. I am so happy, God. You're, you have the care of this. I'm not worried about a thing. And then nung, 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 all the doubt and worries gnawing at his brain going, what's wrong with you? You're crazy. You're going to go broke. You're going to be living on the streets with your kid and, you know, and your twins that are coming. And you're, anyway, you know, no, no, no. I'm red shoe dancing. Glory to God. I cast the whole of my care upon him because he cares for me. I got another call from him just a few days ago. Now, it's not completely over yet. But, and we don't know. I'll tell you the rest of the story when I know the rest of the story. All I can tell you right now is up to this point. So he calls me the other day. He says, Gary, you're not going to believe what I'm about to tell you. I said, I probably will. <laughs> but at this while. He said, well, I never did get any real wisdom from the Lord. So he said, the only thing I could come up with. I have to go talk to them because the, the increase is coming. I have to go talk to my customers. And, and he said, what I, what I thought I'd have to do, and I'm going to, I don't want to, see, I don't want to say, say particulars where you, your brain thinks about his business. We're talking about you and your job. You understand what I'm saying? Doesn't matter what his business was. Doesn't matter what your business is. Doesn't matter what your job is. Same God. Same provider. Same red shoe dancing. Got it? So he had this, he, he came up with this, Ishmael, <laughs> which in the natural looked like the only thing to do, it would solve the customer's problem, but it would cost him about $3,000 per customer, which would take years to recover that. But that's what he was willing to do. So he went in, he started just approaching them and telling them, this is the situation that's before me. And he's just one of those guys, just an open book, you know, he's very easy to read and, you know, there's no deception in him. So he just laid it out in front of him. He says, now here's what I can do for you, and we'll switch this, and it won't, that way your price won't increase. Or you could go ahead and go with this new pricing thing they have. The only benefit you get is this little slight benefit here. And they go, well, that's a pretty good benefit. The first one that he went to said, well, that's, I've been wanting that benefit. It's going to cost how much? Double? Okay, we'll do that. And they just signed. And he says, I went walking out of there going, what? <laughs> What, what just happened? They got a slight little benefit, double the price, and they go, yeah, that sounds good. We'll do that. He says, so I went to the next one. Exactly the same thing. As, the as of the time he called me, six out of six so far. He said, the reason God wasn't telling me what to do, I didn't have to do anything. <laughs> He literally had it all worked out. He says, 
I don't know how it's going to end, whether all 14 is going to do that. I'm just calling to give you this report so far. I said, call me at the end. I want to hear the rest of the story. What was most important? Red shoe dancing. Keep that attitude before the Lord. You are my source, my job. I appreciate my job. I appreciate my business, God. I thank you for all of that. You should worship him for that. But my job is never my source. My business is never my source. God, you are my provider. You are my source. And when any kind of report comes, I choose to believe the report of the Lord. I'm going to be red shoe dancing on the inside, no matter what it looks like on the outside. God, and I, I see when it says humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. We looked in these scriptures in the last few weeks. Jesus said, if I cast out devils by the finger of God, is the finger of God on the hand? Who is the hand of who, what does he mean, the hand of God? Which member of the Godhead is with you, in you, all the time, everywhere? God the Father is in heaven. Jesus in his glorified body is seated at his right hand. Who? It's the Holy Ghost. That's the hand of God. Now, I know, don't write me no letters again. I know God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. They're all three. They're all one. I thought, the more I think about that, the more my brain leaks out my left ear. But, but I do know when it says humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and then it says resist the devil, resist steadfast, what he's talking about there is casting all your care upon the Lord. Humble yourself, pray in the Spirit. But who was it one time I heard say, a scared prayer ain't worth nothing? You really, I don't know if that's really true. I can't find scripture for that. But I do find scripture that says the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord. Can you picture your... I wish I, could, I wish I could project that video up here. Cole doing that red shoe dancing. Man, he's just... Right in the midst of the bad report. If you're going to really believe his report that he will take your cares and do something about it, you would be red... See, you would be red shoe dancing. If you got a bad report, Friday is your last day. And maybe you've been there 10 years. And you, you, you know, you don't know where your next meal's coming from. And right there, if you held that up and suddenly through the wall, you saw God walking towards you. And he's rolling up his sleeve. He says, I have come to reveal my bare arm on your behalf. Now, all of a sudden, that report doesn't look nearly so scary as it did before, does it? And if God says, you just give that to me and I'll take care of it, you don't have to worry about a thing. At that moment, would you not be red shoe dancing? <laughs> Well, he wants you doing that because that's exactly the report of the Lord. That is exactly what he said he will do. That doesn't always mean you don't have to redo things. See, I fully expect still yet. I told him, I talked with my businessman friend. I said, you're going to wind up being a better businessman after this is over. I said, I bet you don't any longer keep yourself with just one supplier with that kind of power over you. He said, you got that right. <laughs> see, you're going to learn some wisdom out of this thing, see. You know, you learn by doing. Yes, sir. All right. Well, isn't that something? Hmm. Okay. You know, the ultimate bad report was the day that uh, God told Abraham. Now, yes, sir. See, see, now watch this. Watch the mind of Christ. <laughs> I'm not this smart. <laughs> After you've had a good report and you've had the major victory like Abraham did, and Isaac is born. The promise has been manifested. You got it. And then you get another report. And this report says, now, kill that, kill that blessing. Offer Isaac. Remember that? Offer Isaac. Boy, now. And the report came from the one that you're supposed to trust. <laughs> the faith of Abraham astounds me, by the way. I was... Uh, you know, you get a report from him, and he says, D -d 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 by the way, do y'all know that in, I I'll just tell you, every December, when we get into December, about the end of the year, in my heart, I take Gary Carpenter Ministries, in my heart, and I do every, best I know how. I take it, and I put it on God's altar. And I said, this dies today if you want it to die. I never want it to become my ministry. It is his ministry. He can do whatever he wants to with it. You understand what I'm saying? 
Well, God asked for Isaac. Now, that's a bad report. And they're going up the mountain. And you know Abraham's had some time to think about this. And you know he's already come to his conclusion. Uh, question here. Go ahead and turn to Hebrews 11. No. It's not where it is. Hang on. I saw it somewhere in one of my notes here the other day. See, I have the... I, have the, I don't have it to it. I, I may have to learn the Bible in chapter and verse one of these days. Rather than just these images. There it is. Hebrews 11, look at verse 17. That went to the wrong one. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, he offered up Isaac. He that received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Now, why was he able to do that? Next verse. Accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. What does that mean in a figure? He saw it on the inside. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. He had not seen his boy raised from the dead on the outside yet, but he was already seeing it in a figure on the inside. You talk about, you talk about a place called done. Now, by the way, I was asked the question. If we, I don't, I, this was not the lesson I was prepared to teach today, but, you know, as, as uh, Abraham and Isaac go up the mountain, they've got the wood, they've got the knife. And Isaac is quite, you know, his faith is pretty amazing too. You know, they, I think he was roughly 19 years old. He's not a, not a little kid. He's like 19 or something. They're going up the mountain and he's going, okay, I see the wood. I see the knife. I know we're headed to an altar. Now, just exactly where is that sacrifice, Father? <laughs> what is it we're going to offer? And Abraham says an amazing thing. I wish I had this where I could just tell you where it is. But Abraham basically says, God will provide himself a lamb. For years, I thought that Abraham somehow knew that God wasn't going to have him uh, really kill his son. And I thought when he said that, God will provide himself a lamb, that he was talking about that lamb that was caught, had its horns, the ram with its horns caught in the thicket. But that's not true because of this verse we're looking at here in Hebrews 11. He wasn't talking about that. And for years I'm going, what, was he prophesying? Was he thinking somehow this is looking forward to Jesus, you know? And for years I didn't have it. And then finally that verse where Jesus said, Abraham saw my day and rejoiced. <laughs> Abraham knew that this was part, that whatever, this whole event was part somehow involved in God's total plan of redemption. And that somehow through this, God was providing himself a lamb that would eventually come through the Lord Jesus Christ. Abraham saw my day. God had revealed enough to him that he knew. But that means in his own heart, he didn't know a thing about that ram caught by the horns in the thicket that day. And Abraham on the way up the mountain, he told his servants, he says, I and the lad will return to you. So now what's Abraham's faith? It's right here. Verse 17, by faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. Did he? In the natural? No, no. Now did he in the natural? Did he plunge the knife through his heart? Not in the natural. Here we go again at that place called done. God says he did offer him up. We'd say legally, no, he didn't. He, he nearly did. I mean, he was going to do it. You know, he had the knife raised. We, we would say, but in a court of law, well, you were there. You were a witness. You witnessed the whole thing. Did Abraham offer up Isaac or not? Well, he was nearly did it, but he didn't really do it. What are you basing your evidence on? What I saw with my five physical senses. He didn't really offer him up. What does the Bible say? Hello? 
he offered him up. God says he did offer him up too. How can God call that? Here we go again. Here's the point where God, where Abraham raises the knife and we're witnesses in the natural. We never saw that knife come down into Isaac, did we? We would say it, Isaac is not really fully offered until a different point in time when the knife came down. In a court of law, isn't that not how you would testify? Well, he nearly did it. I saw him raise the knife, but he didn't really offer it up. So in a court of law, so did Abraham offer up his son? We would say no. God says yes. Because he counted that moment he saw Abraham do it in his heart. God said, done. Done. Here we go again. Over and over. The moment Mary says in her heart, be it unto me according to thy word. God said, done. And the angel departed. Didn't have to close her mouth. The moment you believe God's promise, God says, done. And if those fiery darts cannot change your mouth or move you off the plan of God that he assigned to you, your heart is still in faith. You keep on red shoe dancing. You keep obeying God. Continue to do what he said till he tells you something else. And you need to know with full assurance it is already done in the mind of God. When it, and when I say in his mind, <laughs> look at Doug. He's red shoe dancing already over here. He's already red shoe dancing. Glory to God. When we should. Your healing is done the moment you believe it. Your prosperity is done in a good way the moment, <laughs> the moment you believe it. It's like you got saved the moment you believed it. We understand this when it comes to salvation. We need to understand it in every realm of life. How many of you are going to do a little more red shoe dancing? I mean, when the problem comes, don't you know that makes the devil mad? Attitude, attitude would be, well, this is the end of this job. Glory to God. Nothing takes my father by surprise. My life is in his hands. He has a plan for my life. Dear God, I bet the next job is going to be even better. Maybe I don't even have to get a next job. Maybe I just go to work for him in the kingdom. Whatever it is, I'm, excuse me, I got to do a little red shoe dancing. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Woo. Red, well, they're brown, but anyway, red shoe dancing. With an attitude like that, you are undevourable. You can't be managed by the devil anymore. You escaped, Mark 4. You escaped. You're a free child of God, free to enjoy him and obey him. And enjoy all the goodness of his kingdom. And we'll see you in 30 minutes.